Gambling administrators learn their trade outside of the law. Besides this, gambling establishments attract various forms of crime to the area. Since law and government have an important educational function, one doesn't like to see them involved in gambling. Governments should be more than profit maximizers. They should be concerned chiefly with the public good. Gilbert and Sullivan. Gilbert and Sullivan are the authors of many lively and humorous operettas. These works are the most popular of their kind and are regularly performed today. But the two authors are known almost as well for their arguments and disagreements. The famous partners were very different people with very different interests. William S. Gilbert wrote the words that Sullivan set to music. Gilbert had a special talent for humorous verse. He loved puns and had a very quick wit. Personally, though, he was very businesslike. He had wanted to enter the military and always had the look of a soldier about him. He was fond of giving orders and disliked criticism of anything he did. Arthur S. Sullivan, on the other hand, was a sensitive, emotional person whose main interest was music. Sullivan came from a poor family, but his musical talent and good looks had helped him to succeed. Sullivan wanted to write serious classical music, but as a poor man, he needed a source of income. Sullivan also needed someone to direct him. On his own, he had trouble deciding what to do. Gilbert and Sullivan never became really good friends, and at the end of their lives, they had little contact with each other. But the writer and musician needed each other. Gilbert needed a composer who could enliven his writings for the stage. Sullivan needed someone to write a text for his music. Sullivan, who tended to be lazy, needed someone to push him. A theatrical manager named Richard Doyle Cart arranged their first collaboration. Gilbert visited Sullivan and read him his satire on the legal system, Trial by Jury. Sullivan loved the piece and quickly wrote the music. Trial by Jury was produced in 1875 and became the first triumph for the partners. Doyle Cart decided to form an acting company, which would stage future works by Gilbert and Sullivan. A string of successes follows: The Sorcerer in 1877, HMS Pinafore in May 1878, The Pirates of Penzance in December 1878, Patience in 1881, Ireland in 1882, The Mikado in 1885, The Yeoman of the Guard in 1888. And the gondoliers in 1889. In spite of these successes, the two partners were not happy. Sullivan did not like the way Gilbert dominated their relationship. Sullivan had to write music for Gilbert's scripts. Why couldn't Gilbert write words for Sullivan's music? Gilbert, on the other hand, thought that Sullivan got the most of the credit for the success of their operettas, and that he was overlooked. Gilbert was the driving force in the relationship. He was always writing new scripts and taking them to Sullivan. It was Gilbert who rehearsed the actors and supervised the productions. Sullivan had little to do with the actual performance. He usually did conduct the orchestra on opening night. The amazing thing is how these two different people produced such wonderful work. Each separately had difficulty writing something that the public wanted. Together, they were unbeatable. Gilbert's sharp and often cutting remarks were made acceptable by Sullivan's beautiful music. Gilbert's satire might have made people angry, but Sullivan's music calmed them down. Even when the English people were the targets of Gilbert's criticisms, the audience went out of the theater humming these criticisms to Sullivan's music. Hawaii, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, far from any land, there are the Hawaiian Islands. These islands are the tops of a chain of volcanic mountains. Two volcanoes on the island of Hawaii are still active. There are five larger islands. Kauai is to the west. Oahu, Molokai, and Maui are in the middle, and Hawaii is to the east. There are three smaller islands. Hawaii is the largest island of the group, but Oahu has the largest population. The capital city Honolulu is on Oahu. Since the Hawaiian Islands are so far from any land, one might wonder how people arrived there. The answer is that the first Hawaiians were very good sailors. They traveled thousands of miles from other islands in the Pacific in canoes. To keep these canoes stable in the ocean, they attached an outrigger or pontoon to the main canoe. Sometimes they fastened two canoes together and put a wooden platform on top. 
Then they could carry lots of people and supplies. The first Hawaiians were Polynesians and probably came from the Marquesas and Tahiti in the South Pacific. They were a tall, good-looking people. Their kings made rules about how their people should live, and priests and advisers called kahunas enforced these. Today, the phrase "the big kahuna" means someone who is or thinks he is very important. Although Hawaii lies within the tropics, it has a very mild climate. Sea breezes keep the weather from getting too hot, even in the summer. Many edible plants grow in abundance there, so it was not difficult for the Hawaiians to live very comfortably without working hard. Captain Cook was the first European to reach Hawaii in 1778. Soon, European and American ships visited there regularly. The sailors also brought diseases formerly unknown. By 1853, the population had dropped to 73,000 from about 300,000 when Cook visited in 1778. Besides Europeans, people from China, Japan, and the Philippines came to live there. Soon, large plantations of sugarcane and pineapples developed. As more and more land came under Western control, the native monarchy was undermined. American plantation owners were able to arrange for United States control of the islands. Today, the largest industry is tourism. Since the climate is good all year round, visitors can come at any time. When you arrive, a young Hawaiian woman will greet you. She will put a beautiful flower necklace called a lei around your neck. Hula dancers entertain tourists. Hula dancers wear skirts made of long leaves. Each dancer tells a story by moving their arms and hands in a certain way. For meals, the Hawaiians like to dig a pit in the ground, place wood in the pit, and then set the wood on fire. Food wrapped in leaves is then placed on the wood, and the pit is covered with leaves and mats. A feast cooked this way is called a luau. These traditions nowadays are usually performed for tourists or on special holidays. Hawaii is the 50th state of the United States, and its people enjoy all the advantages of the modern world. Henry Ford. Some inventions are based on simple ideas or principles. Barometers are based on the idea that air has weight and pushes down on objects. A barometer measures this air pressure. Evangelista Terricelli invented barometers in Italy in 1643. Other inventions have taken longer to develop. The automobile has thousands of parts, and it took a long time to make a really useful car. Henry Ford was one of the first people to make a reliable automobile. In 1765, James Watt invented the steam engine. Within a few years, a Frenchman, Nicolas Cugnot, had built a steam-powered vehicle. These steam carriages were used in England in the 1800s, but they were big and slow. They looked like a train without the tracks. Most people preferred to travel by train. In Germany during the 1870s and 1880s, Nikolaus Otto and Gottlieb Daimler developed the internal combustion engine. This ran by burning gasoline. Another German, Karl Benz, built a gasoline-powered car. Around the world, there were many inventors trying to build a car that would be better than the one before. Some people thought that electric cars would become common. In the 1890s, several inventors working in the United States developed a gasoline-powered car that was practical for daily use. Henry Ford was born on a farm in Michigan in 1863. As a boy, he loved to take clocks and watches apart and reassemble them. Eventually, he went to work for the Detroit Edison Company. In his spare time, he worked on a horseless carriage, as the early cars were called. In 1896, he completed a car that ran smoothly. He later sold it and made another one. Since early cars were made by hand, they were usually quite expensive. Not only that, but when they broke down. There were no repair shops to take them to. One had to know how to repair a car oneself. Henry Ford tried to make cars which would be affordable and which would not break down very easily. His Ford Motor Company was formed in 1903 in Detroit, Michigan. Since many parts had to be brought together to make a car, Ford developed the assembly line. On the line, each worker would do one specific job. When the car reached the end of the assembly line, it was finished. In this way, many cars could be made in a single day. The result was that Ford was able to bring the price of cars down. 
Ford's Model T car was advertised as being as frisky as a jackrabbit and more durable than a mule. Since it cost hundreds rather than thousands of dollars, many ordinary families were now able to buy a car. Once many people had cars, their habits began to change. People didn't have to live next to the factories or offices that they worked in. Going for Sunday drives or traveling to tourist sites became a common thing. In 1905, a car drove across the United States and back again. In 1912, a car went across Canada from coast to coast. Soon there was public pressure for good roads so that cars could travel anywhere in North America. Henry Ford was not the only inventor of the modern car. However, he was able to make a car that everyone could use and afford. It could be a whole lot better. As I was sitting in the reading room at the library, a man got up and left, commenting, "It could be a whole lot better." I wasn't sure whether he was referring to the reading room, the world he was reading about, or something else. I replied without thinking, "That's always true and always false." What I meant was that it was always possible to make little changes to improve things, but it isn't clear ahead of time that these changes will make a big overall improvement in a library, in the world, or in anything else. Years ago, literary critics used to examine great writers very closely to find bad phrasing or ungrammatical sentences. They'd look at a play by Shakespeare and identify lines that they didn't think were very good. Sometimes they would suggest that these lines were added by another writer, or that Shakespeare had written this part quickly without much consideration. Sometimes they would omit or improve on the lines. It is doubtful that any of Shakespeare's plays were actually improved by these critics. An entire play needs high points and low points, poetry and prose. The whole thing is greater than its individual parts, and changing a couple of these parts may not improve the whole thing. It is the same in many other areas: music, athletics, scholarship, and probably everyday living. It's not always the singer or musician who is flawless that we admire most. Sometimes it is the person whose performance is not perfect, but who puts a special energy, feeling, or enthusiasm into their work that we admire. It is true that little things can sometimes add up to a big difference. Changing a bad habit can make a difference in your life and in the lives of the people around you. Giving up smoking, for example, or ceasing to criticize a family member, can make an important difference. Sometimes, however, we are only looking at the symptoms of a larger problem. For example, nearly everyone would agree that giving up smoking is a good idea. But if our smoking is related to emotional problems or stress in our lives, then giving up smoking may make us feel even worse. It may be necessary to deal with the root problem. It can happen too that being always on the lookout for ways to improve things may become a problem in itself. Perfectionism means never being satisfied with things as they are, especially if we're always criticizing people around us for not being good enough. This can become a bad thing. A popular saying in North America is, "If it ain't broke, don't fix it." This is a warning to people who feel that their role or position involves making continuous changes in policies, procedures, products, or personnel. Sometimes the drive for change can be more of a personality problem than a genuine concern to make things better. Real problems are often clearly apparent. Problems like world hunger, personality conflicts. Policies that don't work, poor levels of service, bad manners, and all kinds of troubles are hard to ignore. They are also difficult to resolve. Perhaps that's one reason why some people identify things as problems which are of concern to hardly anyone except themselves. Yes, we can make the world and the reading room better, but we can also make them worse. It takes a lot of discernment and usually some experience to know how to make a particular thing better. There are so many things that could use improvement that it is difficult to know where to start. This too requires some thought, not to mention prayer and study. We can start by asking whether the thing we see as a problem is also a problem for other people. If it isn't, then maybe our energy and attention might be better employed elsewhere. John Chapman, American pioneer. When the first Europeans came to North America, they found dense forests coming down right to the shore. 
So thick were the forests that it was said that a squirrel could travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River without once touching the ground. Clearing these trees to make room for fields and buildings was a very difficult task for the early settlers. Another difficulty was finding enough food in this new land. Many European crops could not grow in this climate. Carrying and storing seeds over a long period was also risky. Native Indians were often helpful in teaching the settlers how to find food, but sometimes there were no Indians nearby, or they were hostile. John Chapman is famous today because he helped the early settlers grow one important product: apples. Apples could be eaten fresh in the fall or stored through the winter. They could be made into fresh apple juice or alcoholic cider. They could be dried or made into applesauce. Apples also could be made into vinegar, which is very useful for keeping vegetables from spoiling. John Chapman was born in Massachusetts in 1774, the year before the American Revolution began. John's father joined George Washington's army to fight for American independence from Great Britain. While the war was going on, John's mother died. In 1870, John's father married again, and soon John had lots of younger brothers and sisters. John probably worked on his father's farm as he was growing up. Then he worked on neighboring farms. It may be at this time that John began to learn about apples. After the Revolutionary War, the population of the USA was expanding. Many Americans wanted to go west over the mountains to find land in Indian territory. In the fall of 1797, young John Chapman headed west to Pennsylvania. On his way, he gathered leftover apple seeds from the cider mills that he passed. As usual, John walked barefoot, but as he traveled, snow began to fall. He tore strips off his coat and tied them around his feet. Then he made snowshoes out of tree branches. When he arrived in the West, he began to clear land and plant apple seeds. This began a pattern that would last Chapman's whole life. He would travel ahead of the settlers, clear land, and then sell his baby apple trees to the settlers when they arrived. When the area became too settled, Chapman would move further west and start again. Many settlers regarded John Chapman as a strange character. He never bought new clothes, but wore whatever old clothes came his way. But he was always welcome at a settler's cabin. John was good at clearing land, telling stories, and growing apples. He liked children, and children liked him. He was a religious man and would read to the settlers about God and living together peacefully. At this time, there was conflict between the settlers and Indians about land. John managed to be friendly with both groups, but John did warn the settlers if the Indians were planning to attack them. Every fall, John went east to gather more apple seeds. He would then go farther west and find some empty land to plant his seeds. During the warm weather, he tended all his fields of baby apple trees. Once they were properly grown, he sold the seedlings to settlers. When he had earned enough money, he bought land to grow more apple trees. In his own lifetime, he became known as Johnny Appleseed. Legends grew up about him. It was said that his bare feet could melt snow and that he could leap across rivers. Johnny Appleseed never built himself a real home. He was a wanderer all his life, traveling west to Indiana and Iowa and back east again. He enjoyed sleeping outdoors, lying on his back, looking up at the stars, and thinking about God and his world. He died in Indiana in 1845, and no one knows exactly where he's buried. But all through that region are hundreds of apple trees. These apple trees are the most fitting memorial to John Chapman, the legendary Johnny Appleseed. Las Vegas, Nevada. Nevada is a large state of deserts and mountains. Since most of the land is not suitable for farming, the population grew very slowly. In the 1950s, there were only 267,000 people in the entire state. Now there are nearly a million people living in the Las Vegas area alone. Las Vegas has become a major tourist center. It used to be quite a little desert town of the old west, but in the 1950s and 1960s, hotels and gambling casinos were opened. In order to bring tourists to town, these hotels hired well-known entertainers. Soon, Las Vegas became known as a major entertainment center. In order to promote the growth of Nevada, some activities were allowed, which were against the law in other states. These included gambling and prostitution.
It was also easier to get married in Nevada than in some other states. Over time, many other attractions were developed. Much of the activity in Las Vegas goes on at some 30 major hotels. Many of these hotels provide a complete range of services and entertainment. Some of them boast 4,000 or 5,000 rooms. It is common for these large hotels to be organized around a particular theme, such as the Middle Ages, the Arabian Nights, the movies, the circus, Paris, Egypt, or the Far East. The hotel, its restaurants, shops, lounges, and entertainment reflect this theme. For example, the Paris Las Vegas Hotel has a 50 story replica of the Eiffel Tower. The Luxor Hotel has a huge image of an Egyptian sphinx and a replica of the tomb of King Tut. Nearly all of the major hotels also contain a casino, sometimes several casinos. Gambling is a major reason why people come to Las Vegas. There are slot machines, blackjack tables, and roulette wheels, and much more. Even though Las Vegas is in the desert, there is an extravagant use of water. Large swimming pools, water slides, artificial waterfalls, and huge fountains are common. Health spas, beauty salons, fashion boutiques, specialty restaurants, and malls abound. Tennis and golf are also popular. The lavish shows at Las Vegas are world famous. Tall dancing showgirls, like the famous Rockettes, wear beautiful but rather skimpy costumes. Some entertainers, like singer Wayne Newton, rarely leave Las Vegas. The pay there is good, and the audiences are appreciative. Near Las Vegas are other tourist sites, such as the giant Hoover Dam. Behind the Hoover Dam is the large artificial lake. Lake Mead. Further up the river is the Grand Canyon. All these things are a short trip from the city. Las Vegas is called the city that never sleeps. At nearly any time of the day or night, there are casinos and shows that are open. A monorail connects many of the leading hotels. Many people view Las Vegas as a total entertainment package. One word of caution set yourself a limit on how much you will spend at the casinos. Gambling can be addictive. Laura Secord. Women have often played an important role in war. They have worked in munitions factories, made clothing and supplies, encouraged and entertained soldiers, nursed the wounded, and acted as spies. It is rare, however, for a woman to have played a key role in determining the course of a war. Many people believe that Laura Secord played such a role in the War of 1812. Laura Secord was born in the United States at the time of the American Revolution. Her father had fought in the U.S. Army against the British. But when land in the American states became scarce, the family moved to Ontario, Canada, and so back under British rule. Laura married into a pro British family and adopted their political views. So when the War of 1812 broke out between Britain and America, her husband, James Secord, joined the Canadian militia to defend Ontario against the Americans. The American invasion of 1812 was defeated at Queenston Heights, and some of the wounded were brought to Laura's house in nearby Queenston. Laura went out to the battlefield where she found her husband James, who was severely wounded, and brought him home. In 1813, the U.S. invasion was more successful. Parts of Ontario close to the U.S. border were occupied by American troops. Local families were expected to provide room and board for U.S. officers. It was sometimes possible, therefore, for Canadians to overhear American officers discussing military strategy, either in their homes or Or in the local tavern. The situation in Ontario looked desperate. In the spring of 1813, the whole province seemed likely to fall into American hands. In June, Laura overheard talk of an American attack on the British outpost at Beaver Dams. Her husband was still suffering from war injuries, and she had to look after him and their children. Nevertheless, she resolved to go to warn the British commander. Possibly, Laura did not intend to walk the whole way herself. She hoped to be able to pass on the news to someone else along the way. 
First, she would have to make up a story to get past the American sentries. She left Queenston in early morning and walked 19 miles to the neighborhood of Beaver Dams by nightfall. She still had to cross a wide stream and climb up the Niagara Escarpment. There, she came upon an encampment of Indians who were assisting the British. Their war cries in the moonlight terrified her, but she insisted on being taken to the British commander. Finally, one of the chiefs escorted her to British headquarters, and she was able to tell Fitzgibbon the American plan of attack. When the Americans arrived in the neighborhood of Beaver Dams, the Indians had prepared an ambush for them. A running fight ensued between the American force of 570 soldiers and 450 Indians supporting the British. At this point, Fitzgibbon arrived with 50 British regulars. Seeing the Americans disorganized and surrounded by the Indians, Fitzgibbon boldly demanded their surrender. By telling the American commander Boatsler that he was facing huge British and Indian forces, Fitzgibbon induced the American leader to turn over his whole army to the British. Although only small armies were involved at Beaver Dams, the battle had great significance. Afterwards, the Americans stayed behind their walls for the rest of the year. The U.S. government recalled their commander in chief. British and Canadian morale increased, and Laura's home in Queenston was restored to British control. Laura Secord's story was little known until 1860. She was an old woman in her 80s when she was presented to the visiting Prince of Wales, later King Edward VII. He awarded a gift of money for her services. Her story then became famous. Today, her home in Queenston, Ontario, is an historical museum and a popular tourist attraction. Video designed by English Seven Levels dot com. Little House on the Prairie. Much of the history of North America is about how Europeans moved westward from the Atlantic coast towards the Pacific. The first settlements began around 1600, and it was a long time before the Europeans settled the interior. By the late 18th century, however, good farmland along the east coast was becoming scarce. As the population increased, people began thinking about all the native Indian lands further inland. Families were quite large in pioneer days, and the oldest son usually inherited the family farm. This meant that other sons and daughters would have to move away when their parents died. Often, the sons would want to begin their own farm and start their own family. But if there was no farmland available, or if it was too expensive to buy, they were out of luck. One option was to move west, where land was free or very cheap. Sometimes the whole family might move if their old farm was no longer productive. Sometimes the old farm was on poor soil, or too much farming had exhausted the soil. Perhaps better land could be had further west. There were other reasons for moving west. Pioneer settlers depended on wild birds, fish, and wild animals for food, furs, and skins for clothing and trading, and trees for building materials. These things had become scarce in old settled areas. Out west, there were lots of animals to hunt for food, and animal skins could be traded for supplies. It seemed that it was easier to make a living on the frontier. Of course, there were some problems regarding moving west. Various American Indian tribes who might fight to defend their land occupied the land. Then the land needed to be cleared of trees and stumps before it could be planted. A log cabin and other buildings had to be built. A well had to be dug, or a spring of water found. Settlers might also suffer because there were no doctors or teachers or stores available. These things, though, often did follow closely behind the first settlers. A series of little house books, written by Laura Ingalls Wilder, tells the story of her pioneer family. The Ingalls family moved many times while Laura was a little girl. She was born in Wisconsin in 1867. Her family moved next year to Missouri, 
Then they moved to Kansas in 1869. The Ingalls moved back to Wisconsin in 1871. They moved to Minnesota in 1874. Her family went to Iowa in 1876, then back to Minnesota in 1877. Finally, they moved to Desmit, South Dakota, in 1879, and there the family remained. All these moves were typical for a pioneer family, always on the lookout for better land and other opportunities. But all these moves involved very hard work. All of which seemed all lost when the family had to move again. For example, when Laura's parents moved to the Kansas Prairie in 1869, they had many hardships. The family put all their belongings in a covered wagon, which measured four feet by ten feet. Two horses.